get started. Uh, welcome to the session Kubernetes Suicide status update. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And my name is Vasily. And together with Dario, we would like to give an overview as well as to provide some updates on what we have been doing with regards to the Kubernetes project within virtualization team at SUSE. Um, so here is our agenda for today. Uh, we would like to begin uh, with a short recap of what Kubert is about. Uh, then we will, we will highlight our downstream work at SUSE, how we maintain and support Kubert, focusing mostly on the open build service integration parts and building custom container images. Uh, we will also touch the topic of upstream involvement and contributions. And finally, we'll present the results of our recent research activity, uh, the cost of containerizing PMs. So in case uh, someone is not familiar with Kubert project, let's start with a short overview. <clears throat> uh, Kubert is a virtualization management add-on for Kubernetes. Uh, it's an open source project uh, initially started by Red Hat. Currently, it's developed and maintained by the community. Uh, Kubert allow, allows running VMs on scale on multi-node clusters with different hardware and capabilities. It provides a comprehensive set of features uh, uh, like uh, live migration, hot plug volumes, uh, huge pages support, dedicated CPU placement, just to name a few. Uh, so with Kubert, uh, the VM workloads are managed in a declarative way in the same uh, fashion as other Kubernetes resources. Kubert introduces new custom resource types, uh, namely virtual machine and virtual machine instance. Those are registered via the so-called custom resource definition API within Kubernetes. And that actually allows to manage VMs uh, by the means of YAML files and standard kubectl command. <clears throat> a simple example of a virtual machine YAML definition is shown on this slide. Uh, the most interesting bits are under the spec session here, uh, which contains a working configuration of VM. Uh, here it includes uh, the description of disks layout uh, with the boot container disk and uh, cloud any disk. Additionally, sets the memory requirements for the VM here, uh, provides the uh, termination grace period, and also references the volumes. Uh, the running state, which is here, is initially set to false, uh, which means that after applying this YAML file with kubectl, uh, the VM will have to be started manually. Well, Kubert uh, uh, VM instances are run in pods. So there is uh, one pod for each uh, VM instance that allows the VM workloads to seamlessly coexist alongside the standard containerized applications and to be managed by Kubernetes in a native way like scheduled, assigned to nodes, and etc. cetera. Um, so if we uh, take a deeper look at what Kubert provides under the hood, we can notice the five main uh, core components. Let's say there are two kinds of them. Uh, cluster level components, which uh, have, let's say, cluster-wide scope, and host level components, or otherwise uh, called node level components. Those operate on specific nodes. So let's uh, briefly go through all of them. So the first one is the Virt API. Uh, it's a cluster level component. It is uh, the API server <clears throat> and uh, it's the entry point for all uh, virtualization related requests. Uh, then we have a uh, word controller here. It's another cluster level uh, component. It monitors uh, custom resources like virtual machines, virtual machine instances, etc. And it also manages the associated pods. Uh, then we have a uh, word handler on the picture here. So this is a host level component. It is a privileged pod, a daemon set uh, that runs on each node in the cluster. It is needed to prepare the host for running a VM, like to configure the network, disks, etc. Uh, also we have virt launcher. It's another host level component which hosts the main uh, virtual machine instance process. In fact, uh, it runs uh, the KVM stack which is a little bit daemon and a QEMA instance. Also, last but not least, um, it's not shown in this picture, but <clears throat> there is a, a virt operator, 
another component which manages Kubernetes deployment on the cluster. And it's also a cluster level component. So uh, roughly one year ago, uh, we at SUSE started exploring the available virtualization solutions for Kubernetes. Uh, so by that time, we had already evaluated some projects and eventually the choice was made in favor of Kubert. So at SUSE Labs conference 2020 last year, there was a talk uh, presented by Jim Felix describing our journey to VMs and containers. So the outcome of this journey was the integration uh, with the build service and publishing of uh, customized uh, SUSE based container images in public registers. So now let's have a look at what is going on at the downstream Kubernetes front. Um, so when it comes to building the binaries and container images, uh, Kubernetes uh, is uh, unfortunately not very OBS friendly, let's say. While enabling the build in OBS, we face several challenges uh, due to the Bazel build system, which Kubert heavily relies on. So to build Kubert project, uh, Bazel requires quite a lot of dependencies, either from the web or in the tarball in case of running an offline build. It's something near several gigabytes. Uh, no easy way of building custom images either, as most of the build scenarios and dependencies are kind of hard coded in Bazel configs. And they also refer to Fedora packages, which is not really an, a good option for us. So eventually, instead of trying to adopt the upstream way of building Kubert within our build service, uh, we decided to follow another path and to leverage the native Go build. That basically allowed us to produce <coughs> Uh, the intermediate RPM packages with binaries in OBS, and then to build the container images separately out of Docker files. So this approach is roughly depicted on the slide. Uh, here we have the main Kubert package uh, that provides the RPMs with the binaries, and also a bunch of Docker file packages. Uh, those consume the binaries. Uh, such scheme allows allowed us to customize the images and to derive them from the SUSE containers as base. So in practice, now we have the complete control of the, over the content of the images, and we do not depend on uh, how those are built upstream. So for example, we can use uh, our own KVM stack and provide new uh, libvirt and QEMO in our images. <laughs> Uh, so at that point, yeah, we managed to set up the downstream build. And uh, now if we look at how uh, Kubvert is deployed, we may notice some additional issues uh, introduced by the chosen approach. Uh, like it is shown on this slide, uh, Kubvert is deployed on a cluster by applying the YAML manifest, uh, namely a Kubvert operator and Kubvert custom resource. Uh, Apart from many specific settings, those manifests contain information about proper container registry uh, to pull the images from and the tags. And uh, the manifests are generated during the build of RPM packages in OBS. However, the container images are tagged on a separate step only when Docker files are built. Uh, and as a result, such a split of RPM and container builds, uh, it brings additional, let's say, requirements. And uh, fulfilling those is kind of mandatory in order to ensure proper Kubert deployment. So the following conditions must be met. Uh, the tags must be unique for each individual build. Also, the tags must be consistent between the manifest and all the containers. So currently, uh, just note, we have six containers for Kubert. <laughs> Uh, and let's look more closely at each of these uh, conditions. So the requirement of having unique tags for each build uh, comes from the need to respect uh, Kubernetes image pool policy if not present. Uh, so if uh, with that policy, Kubernetes uh, will pull image an image only if it does not already exist in the local cache. And uh, the tag is used to distinguish between the various versions of the same image. 
The upstream covert uh, relies on the calculated image digests to uniquely identify the builds and to deploy proper versions. Uh, unfortunately, it's not an option when it comes to building an OBS uh, because currently there is no uh, straightforward way to extract the digest of a Docker container uh, image, Docker file container image, and to make it available for an RPM package uh, so it can be included in the manifest, for example. Uh, therefore, here we've come up with a more OBS native, let's say, solution. We decided to use the RPM version information. <clears throat> More precisely, uh, attack composed of the macros uh, version and release. It provides a unique identifier that gets incremented every build, and therefore it can be used to also uniquely identify the container images. But uh, this, however, brings some limitations, and uh, container images and their PM packages now they have to be released together as they become pretty tightly coupled version wise. So additionally, uh, a mechanism to automatically propagate this stack, so the RPM version and release to Docker files is also needed, since doing it manually is uh, kind of error prone and uh, time consuming, considering the amount of containers that we have. And that brings us to the second requirement, which is about consistency of the tags. <laughs> so for <clears throat> Implementing such an automated mechanism, uh, we introduced a couple of OB OBS build services. So the first one is uh, called replaced using ENV, maybe not the best name, uh, but anyway. So it's an independent generic OBS service. Uh, it reads the environment variables from a given file and performs substitution in the sources. So in our case, in the Docker file. And the second one is uh, Covert Containers Meta. It's another build service, and uh, the interesting thing is that it gets generated during the build along with the manifest. So basically, it provides the environment file specific for the Covert use case with proper registry and unique tags. So here on the picture uh, is demonstrated uh, the, the, the flow of build time patching is uh, demonstrated. So both uh, services are referenced and configured from the service file. Then uh, replace using uh, ENV, it sources the uh, Kubernetes containers meta and then replaces or patches the Docker file, uh, replacing the variables, of placeholder variables with the values of uh, from the environment. <clears throat> uh, yeah, also uh, on this picture, you can see the example of the environment file provided by Kubernetes containers meta and uh, how Docker file uh, placeholder vars uh, variables look like. So basically uh, that way the tax and the register information that gets generated during the build of the manifest RPM get it's automatically propagated to containers via the build services. The scheme ensures that the released images are properly tagged and eventually the manifests, they refer to existing containers. Uh, the solution is actually heavily inspired by some existing helper build services and uh, works quite nicely at the moment. Most of the variables provided by Covert Containers Meta are automatically determined uh, within the spec file and hence we use more or less the same code for different projects. And yeah, even more packages and containers. <laughs> so in the context of this talk, it's also worth to mention the containerized data importer. It's another add-on for Kubernetes focused on persistent storage management. It is primarily used for building and importing virtual machine disks for Kubert. So CDI introduces data volume custom resource, which is an abstraction of, on top of uh, standard Kubernetes persistent volume claims. It is used to automate the creation of VM disks and to populate them with data uh, from various sources like container registries, uh, HTTP servers, local images, etc. Kubert and CDI can work independently, but when used together, they provide better user experience. Thus, CDI is also maintained downstream and released along with Kubert. 
the CI project has similar structure. It's also written in Go language, <clears throat> and it relies on Bazel for building binaries in containers. And therefore, the same approach is used for CDI as well. Basically, we build it the same way as Kubert. And uh, just to note, there are seven containers for uh, CDI. So in total, six for Kubert, seven for CDI, and uh, a bunch of RPMs provided by both packages. That's what we maintain at the moment. And uh, so, yeah, this is the state where we currently are with regards to the downstream work at SUSE. So for OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, we maintain a rolling release of Kubert. We do regular updates, uh, trying to follow the upstream release cycle, which is monthly, on a monthly, monthly basis. Uh, apart from that, we have Kubert 0.40 and CDI 1.30 uh, images based on C15 SP2, and they are released publicly uh, at registrysusi.com. And also we have Kubert 0.45. It's uh, not the latest already, but it was the latest uh, at the time of the writing this slide. Uh, so we have zero. Uh, dot 45 and one dot uh, ncdi 137 images based on c15 sp3 they also released and publicly available at registrysusi.com and in fact we already have a consumer for our images the harvested projects adopt our SUSE downstream images so 0 0.2 release uses open SUSE tumble with based images uh, the latest 0 0.3 uh, uses 3 uh, 15 sp3 based and we plan to provide support for the GA release, which comes next. Apart from the work we do downstream, we also try to be involved in the upstream activities. We participate in code reviews, weekly meetings, uh, provide bug fixes and improvements, uh, not only for Kubert itself, but for the CI and the automation. Also deliver new features to the project, like the ones mentioned here. So, for example, uh, we provide initial support for C groups version two. Uh, we basically identified several issues uh, preventing Kubert cool from running VMs on the nodes with C groups v two. Uh, also enabling, uh, enabled uh, the submit uh, pre-submit and periodic jobs in uh, CI to avoid regressions. And uh, yeah, there are some things that are still work in progress. It's device handling. Uh, it's not yet implemented, but in progress, let's say. Uh, apart from that, we pr uh, implemented live migration with hot plug volumes. <clears throat> Actually, the support of hot plug uh, volumes has been around for quite a while in Kubert, but it wasn't possible to live migrate virtual machines with dynamically attached storage. So we initiated several discussions around that and proposed a series of patches to leave that limitation. Eventually, the patches were accepted and merged. Currently, we are working on a proposal on POC for enabling confidential computing in Kubert by leveraging secure encrypted virtualization technology from AMD. So, and with this, I think it's all from my side. Now I will hand over to Dario, who will talk about our recent research around the performance evaluation and the cost of containerizing VMs. Right. Silly, I just find myself a tech presenter. I can do it. And here we go. So, um, yes, as Vasily, as Vasily said, in addition to all the activities that uh, we are doing, that EMOS team is doing, uh, on both upstream and downstream, uh, Kubert, uh, we have recently done some um, performance investigation. Basically, the idea was uh, trying to uh, think about and envision and also then verify with benchmarks uh, uh, what are the differences uh, performance wise uh, of running a VM with the traditional KVM stack, uh, which is basically running uh, on directly on the host. Uh, and inside uh, all the various containers and components and clusters and uh, everything that Vasily explained 
uh, when the VMI, uh, the VM is a VMI uh, running inside QWERTY. And uh, we were mostly interested in uh, uh, seeing uh, whether uh, the additional component, the additional code path that uh, would need to be, to be traversed uh, at least uh, certain times, depending on uh, what are the operations that, uh, that, 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 that are actually uh, done when, for example, running a benchmark, uh, would introduce over it themselves. And also, uh, what were the uh, possibility that we have for tuning uh, virtualization workloads, so a virtual machine basically, uh, while when this is uh, running, uh, when, when the VM is uh, actually not a standard KVM VM, but a uh, Kubert VMI. And what we discover is that we can do a lot of uh, tuning on the Kubert side as well, uh, pretty much uh, everything uh, that we can do on traditional uh, virtualization, but uh, at least in the version of Kubert that we used for this benchmark, we have to reevaluate newer versions because there have been changes. Uh, the more you tune the VM and the worse performance you get, which is uh, very, very interesting uh, results, not to call differently. And yeah, I'm just uh, going to mention quickly that, uh, uh, yes, Vasily already introduced me. I am Dario, also from the virtualization team. And uh, this work has been, uh, uh, this part of this work, uh, uh, the performance uh, research and investigation has been carried out by me, Vasily, and uh, uh, also, uh, Gokhon Lee from um, the Nara Institute of, Institute of Technology. The collaboration. Yes, I, do, I, I read on the chat that uh, a question about do you have an, an example of virtual machine tuning? I do. Uh, I will cover that part in the slides and then if, uh, let's see if I answer the question or if there are more doubts, which I will be happy to answer. So it's an experimental uh, evaluation work. So let's check the experimental setup, which was uh, uh, not too big uh, server. Uh, we use two actually, but they were the same. So 32 CPUs, uh, some RAM, not too many, uh, not, not, not too much RAM, uh, but enough for running at least one VM. This, this uh, first uh, performance investigation was limited to one VM, although we tried uh, by adding a load on the host to simulate situations uh, uh, which are a little bit more interesting than uh, when there is only one VM running on the entire host. And uh, especially the storage uh, situation wasn't great. It was a pretty old rotational device. It would be definitely interesting to uh, dig uh, further uh, into what happens uh, with uh, faster and newer disks. Uh, that's uh, what we... Uh, yeah, the, basically the, oh, the mm, something about the topology because it's going to be important uh, of, the, uh, of our server. It was NUMA with just two nodes, uh, and uh, it had um, uh, hyper-threading uh, available and enabled. 32 CPUs on two nodes, uh, eight cores, and two threads. And it's a graphical representation of it. So software-wise, uh, Due to various reasons, the host was a new Ubuntu actually, but then the guest uh, was uh, OpenSUSE. Uh, yes, OpenSUSE Leap 15.2, sorry. And uh, we basically try to put ourselves in the situation where uh, the version of Kimo used uh, and Libvirt uh, used uh, in uh, uh, the traditional KVM uh, setup was the same uh, as the ones that uh, we find inside Kubert, uh, in the version of Kubert that, uh, that we used. And the details are uh, uh, about this in this slide. The virtual machine, we 
tried, uh, we run our benchmark inside the multiple uh, uh, configuring multiple configurations. Uh, so we run them in um, uh, just one vCPU virtual machine and also in uh, uh, four vCPUs virtual machine. These are different experiments. And here I have the results only for the four vCPUs case. Uh, it had uh, eight gigabyte of RAM. Uh, the storage for the, the, the virtual disk was uh, just file-based. I'll back far back, sorry. The guest OS was on to sleep and uh, we used MMTest, of course, as a benchmark in suite. We did run a few benchmark. Uh, there are some details about their configuration in the slides. We use cyclic, te cyclic test to try to uh, capture some uh, details about uh, latency. We use an as parallel benchmark uh, as a CPU. Uh, intensive benchmark stream for memory, then uh, ArcBench, CanBench uh, for uh, yeah, CPU scheduling, uh, this kind of uh, aspects, uh, and IOZone for um, IO. And uh, yeah, that's what I was uh, anticipating before. We uh, let's focus on the for vCPUs VM uh, configuration, because this is the one that I'm going to show results uh, about. And uh, we run all those benchmarks that I mentioned inside uh, a four vCPUs VM, uh, first uh, a KVM one and then a Cube Virt one, let's say. But we also did uh, this uh, while uh, the host was completely idle. So there was, except for our VM running the benchmarks, of course. Uh, then we repeated it uh, when the host was loaded, uh, not with other VMs, uh, but in this particular case, uh, only with the synthetic load generated with stress NG. It's not perfect. Uh, other VM would have been better, and uh, we will probably do it at some point uh, but in this case the yes we used some synthetic load generator on the host and the idea was to try to load the system um, halfway so simulating basically seven other vms so eight in total uh, uh, including our ones with uh, four vcpus each each one busy uh, only at a 50 percent level and then uh, we tried uh, an highly loaded situation where uh, the, for example, the load that we generated could be seen as, rep as being representative of uh, uh, also a system with eight VMs with four CPUs, but all uh, loaded at 100%. Of course, when I say all loaded at 100% or 50%, I refer to the synthetic uh, ones, let's say. Our one was loaded as much as the benchmark that was running uh, in that uh, specific uh, uh, moment. Uh, uh, So tuning, um, basically one way, one very effective way of tuning virtualization performance is doing uh, static or semi-static resource partitioning. So that do, by, by doing that, you cut the overhead uh, and uh, you also avoid interference uh, between uh, various, uh, for example, uh, work by different VMs or VMs and the synthetic load running on the system uh, at the same time. So, yeah, we considered uh, uh, mem some memory tuning, uh, let's say, by um, uh, implementing trans, um, by looking at different huge pages configurations and also pinning the memory. We pin the virtual CPUs and also the uh, IO thread and emulator thread. Then we uh, looked into the virtual topology and uh, then also some other stuff, which uh, I'm not going to cover in details. Instead, for this one that I just mentioned, uh, I will just explain um, them in a little bit more details in a minute. So for uh, tuning uh, KVM, but I mean, in general, uh, if you want to tune virtualization, you can um, use huge pages. Uh, in various ways, you can use transparent huge pages, you can uh, statically pre allocate, pre -allocate uh, two megabytes or one gigabyte huge pages. This latter configuration is the best one, pre allocating one gigabyte huge pages and then using that as the 
backing of the memory of the VM, because of course you cut the uh, number of uh, uh, steps that are necessary for uh, translating addresses, uh, and also you lower the pressure on TLB, so it's better on a uh, number of, uh, of ways. And it's uh, really something that you do when you want to achieve uh, best performance, and it's possible to do that uh, both on uh, KVM and also on lots of work compared. Now, virtual topology. Uh, this is a fairly complex topic which would require a talk in itself, but trying to uh, be, give some quick details. Uh, uh, of course, hardware has uh, topology, a physical topology, and uh, well, as a matter of fact, it's possible to define a uh, topology also for virtual machines. It would be a virtual topology. And being virtual, uh, you can uh, basically, when you configure the virtual machine, define it uh, as pretty much as you wish. Um, for example, uh, in our case that we have a uh, four vCPUs VM, we can define a, a virtual topology for such VM that is uh, uh, like this. So where each virtual CPU of the VM uh, is seen, for example, if you look at it from inside the VM, from both the kernel and the user space, uh, if you check, if you use all the tools that you use for inspecting the topology on bare metal, you use them inside of the VM, you uh, would see that uh, this VM, if the virtual topology is defined uh, like this, uh, picture and it's part of the picture here you will see that it has uh, four sockets and each socket has one core and each core has one thread of course this is not uh, what uh, is uh, uh, really uh, happening on the hardware but we don't care it's virtual topology and uh, uh, it's of course possible to do other um, missions to, to define it in different ways as well uh, which is for example one could be this one when you just specify one socket and uh, the four vcpus are all part of the same socket but uh, are all uh, their own uh, core and there is no virtual hyperthreading let's say on the other end you can also specify something like this these are all just uh, examples you can specify one socket and only one core and four threads uh, or something which is probably closer to the hardware, for example, to the hardware that we were using, uh, you can specify one socket and uh, two cores and inside of each of these two cores, two threads. Of course, this is for a four vCPUs VM. If you have more vCPUs, which wasn't our case, but just as an example, you can, uh, for example, uh, have uh, more sockets uh, or uh, anything that you want, really. Another thing that uh, is part of a uh, static or semi-static partitioning kind of tuning of a virtualization workload is virtual, is virtual CPU pinning. So basically, KVM virtual CPUs are pretty much tasks, regular tasks from the point of view of the scheduler, uh, of the Linux scheduler running on the host. And so you can set the affinity of these tasks and, this, and decide where they uh, would be uh, scheduled by, by the scheduler of the host in terms of uh, in, on which uh, physical CPUs they are uh, allowed to run. And of course, you can define these in many ways. For example, you can, uh, like in this example, uh, uh, configure for this uh, single vCPU VM, uh, you can configure the vCPU pinning in such a way that uh, uh, it's only virtual CPU can run uh, on these two, uh, these two physical CPUs, which as a matter of fact are two threads of one physical core in this example. You can configure things in this way where you specify the affinity of all the four virtual CPUs of this VM and you say that uh, all the four of them can run on uh, all the four of these physical CPUs, and then it will be the scheduler that decide which one runs on uh, which uh, physical CPU. There are, yeah, really many possibilities. Uh, one 
pretty common configuration if you have enough resources is to do one to one DCPU pinning. So you specify for each virtual CPUs only one physical CPU, one physical CPU on which uh, it will be scheduled, which is, a, for example, what happens here. Now, you may uh, start to see that. Uh, yes, thank you. You may start to see that uh, virtual topology and virtual CPU pinning uh, have some relationship between each other they, they, they and that uh, perhaps uh, of course you are free to do whatever you want uh, but uh, the actual results might differ depending on uh, how you mix uh, these two uh, features together because for example uh, if you do like this so you define a virtual topology for the vm which uh, is uh, made up of one socket and in this socket uh, you define two cores and in this core you define two threads uh, for each core and then you do one-to-one -one virtual CPU pinning in such a way that uh, yes each virtual CPU run only on one physical CPUs but uh, more specifically the virtual CPUs that you have defined as being part of a, a virtual core let's say also uh, run on a physical core on the same physical core all the time and uh, the same for the other core this is uh, basically basically means that you are making a perfect match uh, between uh, the virtual and the physical topology which is likely going to provide the best performance uh, and also as you will see uh, on the actual results you can do different things that at least are not wrong, also maybe not as good as this one. And you can do very much wrong things and completely mess up uh, your performance if you do like, uh, for example, like something like this, where you define the virtual topology in this way, you have cohorts and threads, but then you pin uh, the virtual CPUs, which are from the point of view of the virtual topology in the same core, to physical CPUs, which are in different cores. It's legal, of course, but uh, you shouldn't expect uh, good performance if you do it, probably. Yeah, and then uh, there is new memory pinning, uh, which uh, means that uh, if the virtual CPUs of your VMs are going to run on physical CPUs that are on a specific NUMA node, then you also want the memory to be there, nothing special really. And also what I mentioned uh, quickly about IO threads uh, and emulator threads, but although we ran some experiments uh, uh, with these configurations, uh, I'm not going into details because I don't have time and uh, because uh, yeah, the IO experiments weren't super interesting, uh, the results, I mean, uh, weren't super interesting in this, uh, uh, or probably because of the not ideal uh, uh, characteristic of the storage subsystem of the host. One thing that we noticed also about IO is that uh, us using a um, pre-allocated raw image uh, meant that uh, we really should also use uh, uh, a specific uh, um, asynchronous IO uh, Trading model. Uh, otherwise, uh, benchmark didn't even weren't even able to uh, to finish. So we had to use uh, native, uh, uh, which I'm not going to explain in details. There's documentation about it. Uh, otherwise, performance were very bad, both for KVM and Qvert. IO Uring would be another very interesting uh, uh, investigation, which we uh, plan to do. So um, I need to speed up a little bit uh, for KVN tuning. We, we we focused a lot on virtual topology and we considered four different uh, possible configurations uh, where the default one is this one. Uh, each vCPU is a single uh, socket, single core, single thread. Then some variations of it. And uh, uh, and in the default case, we weren't doing any virtual CPU pinning, while in the other, in all these three other cases, we were doing one-to-one -one virtual CPU pinning. 
In particular, I want to draw your attention to this uh, one called VTune, uh, which is where we were configuring the system for best performance because we were um, uh, configuring the virtual and the physical topology in a matching way, basically. And we can do that because we are on KVM, we control uh, everything. We control the pinning, we control the virtual topology, everything. And this is how you do it. I'm not spending time on it. Uh, it's in the slides. It's basically pieces of uh, live email config file for implementing various configurations. Uh, on kubevirt, uh, uh, yes, this is just saying that uh, we expect the best performance from this configuration on KVM. On kubevirt, we try to do the same. And as I said, it's pretty much possible to specify, to try to specify this very same exact things. And uh, we did it, but uh, due to the fact that, and this is how you do it in kubevirt by putting this uh, stuff that you see here in the YAML file. However, the problem is that uh, when you do that, uh, and uh, uh, it's not you that are in control, that, that, that are in control of uh, all the, uh, the bits and pieces, because there is Kubernetes that manages where uh, the what CPUs uh, your uh, uh, what physical CPUs your VM get, and uh, instead it's kubevirt that manages the virtual topology, we realized that uh, we were ending up in this situation. So uh, the configuration that uh, uh, on KVM is the best one, when you do traditional virtualization tuning, uh, you do it and you get the best performance. Uh, if you do it, at least on this version of kubevirt, uh, you get something like this. So you can define the virtual topology. You get, uh, uh, you, you try to do one-to-one -one with CPU pinning, but you end up uh, with uh, virtual CPUs, uh, which uh, from the point of view of the kernel inside the VM are part of the same, are, are on the same core, pinned to physical CPU with CPUs which are in different cores. And these, I don't have time to go into the details of all the benchmarks, but for example, uh, check uh, even stream, uh, which uh, is not really especially run in this case, which doesn't saturate the, the, the this configuration, which doesn't saturate the memory bandwidth of the system. It's not really to, too much topology sensitive unless you uh, get it particularly wrong. And we can see that uh, this is the KVM case where uh, uh, these two intermediate setup weren't, uh, this is the higher the better. In this graph, these two intermediate uh, configurations weren't particularly brilliant. This is the default, and this is uh, uh, the VTune, so the one that we expect to be the best performing one, which actually is not by that much, but it is. On kubevert, on the other end, uh, when the system is idle, the VTune one is the worst one. And this is also the case uh, uh, when we increase the load on the host. Let me show you very, very quickly some, sorry, the graph is a little bit small, some, the same situation on other benchmarks where it's even more evident, like uh, uh, NAS parallel benchmark. So when the system is idle, again, there aren't many differences, especially in KVM, if you check the blue and the red bars. Uh, instead, when load increases, so the host is busy and the host scheduler cannot compensate uh, for uh, like a non-ideal topology, the VTune, the red bar, in this case is lower, better. So the red bar in the KVM case is quite a bit lower, which means uh, better performance. On the kubevirt side, it's completely the other way around. So yeah, I'm skipping over the others because uh, they showed, all show pretty much the same trend. We, and especially the IO ones, is, uh, we, we want to repeat the investigation with uh, a, a more sensible and more model configuration. Otherwise, we won't see anything interesting. And uh, yeah, basically, that's uh, something very interesting that we discovered. And uh, we are also happy to, to, to say, though, that uh, version, uh, the next version of Virt already includes some, um, a change which uh, should improve the situation a little bit. And we still haven't tried it, but we are planning to, and we hope to see a different uh, set of results. That's it. Sorry, I took a little bit more time that I, than I wanted, so I don't know if there is uh, any, some... There's one question on the chat from Andreas. <laughs> So, and the, the question is, uh, 
the initial manifest example mentions virta your disks and you mentioned vcp pinning what about uh, signing other physical resources seed background okay uh assigning physical resources in the cube weird case it's not something i am super familiar with so i would have to defer to Vasily to answering whether or not it's uh, possible and uh, with what uh, caveats uh, on plain kvm it probably is um no i mean i, I know it is uh what i can tell is that uh, uh, if you some point sorry some point i mentioned i i showed um a slide uh, something like uh, this uh, which is a uh, virtual cpu pinning uh, virtual topology tuning and also defining uh, additional threads for for uh, io activity in kimu uh, I can tell you, or even if I don't have the slide, that if you try to do something like this on KubeVirt, which is possible to specify it in the manifest, uh, then the topology, the mapping between uh, the virtual and the physical topology is even more messed up than, uh, than what I showed uh, here. So, yeah, all possible, but not great uh, as a result. Basil, do you want to comment yourself quickly? Yeah, regarding the devices, it's possible to assign devices in Kubert as well, so it's supported. There is a user guide uh, listing the all possibilities. And Liang is asking whether we uh, tested uh, different machine types, uh, uh, micro VM, Q35, so different Q machine types. We didn't. Uh, Mostly because of time reasons uh, and uh, because uh, I don't know if you can specify these uh, again. <laughs> I defer to Vasily uh, for knowing whether you can specify things in these details uh, from a Qubit point of view. Mm, I don't remember, to be honest. Machine type, I guess it's possible to specify, yes. Fact is, we didn't notice, except in some, in a couple of benchmarks like cyclic tests, which I didn't have time to cover. We didn't notice much uh, overhead or latency introduced by the fact that the VM is running containerized. Let's say we did see a major impact uh, from the fact that uh, the tuning, uh, although possible, uh, from uh, what you can uh, specify uh, from the point of view of what you can specify uh, in a manifests uh, it at least on that version uh, resulted in uh, really wrong uh, uh, configuration so that that was the major effect that was probably hovering for others maybe Okay, we are already over time so I think I'm going to stop the recording thanks a lot Vasilia <coughs> Dario yeah.